You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War Premium Episode number 18. This week, we continue our investigation into the doctrine of the various armies around Europe during the war. We're going to start with the French, because I find the French interesting. They bore the brunt of the fighting for the Entente for most of the war. However, more emphasis is often put on the British and their adaptation, or failure to adapt, to the conditions of the Western Front than the French. We are also going to start with the French, because we will be using them as a deep dive into the situation in an army in Europe before the war, and we will have different focuses for the other episodes for the other armies. What I mean by this is that we will spend most of our day today discussing the evolution of France's strategy before the war, and then also touch on how it evolved during the war. As we discuss the development of this doctrine, I hope you will keep in mind a few things while making your own judgments and conclusions. First of all, coming into the war, they were making the same decisions and judgments as everybody else, all based on very little real-world data and practice. It had been 40 years since a real war had occurred in Europe. Second, just because the French failed horribly in their opening attacks during the war does not necessarily mean that their entire set of theories and practices were wrong. One large mistake on the battlefield can mask many good practices made along the way, which is something we will get into in more detail here in a bit. Third, one of the prevailing images of the French during the war is the endless assaults on trenches with massive failures every time. However, in the pre-war years, as they were planning and equipping their army, they did not plan on attacking these kinds of objectives. They were planning on a war where most assaults would be on hastily fortified positions in areas with at least some natural cover, and this would set them up for a rude awakening when it came time to adapt to what they actually found themselves doing. Fourth, and as I am sure we discussed in some detail last episode, since all the armies were affected by all of these incorrect assumptions, what really mattered was how they adapted once the war started, and in this case the French did not do a very good job. Over the course of the war, they would fail to implement several of the big innovations that other armies found, like infiltration tactics, and by the end of the war they were still behind in defensive doctrine. This was an issue because in the last several months of the war, or even year really, the French mostly stopped innovating, a trend that had its roots in the mutinies of 1917. After these mutinies, the responsibility for most attacks passed to the British and later the Americans, and the French army leadership stopped experimenting with new methods and theories. This is why during this episode, you will notice our discussions will trail off as the war progresses, as the French really stopped making meaningful changes for us to talk about. You will notice in our episodes on the Germans and British that it will be the exact opposite, making for some interesting comparisons. We begin our discussion today where you have to start any discussion of French military theory and practices before the First World War, the Franco-Prussian War. Before the Franco-Prussian War, the French still relied heavily on massed columns of men charging forward with fixed bayonets. They were firmly in the mass school of operation, which I guess means is a good time to introduce the two schools of thought in military Europe before 1914. The first was the mass school, those who favored a more traditional approach to infantry combat. This theory is best summarized by taking a lot of men and throwing them forward against enemy positions and hoping that they can push through to their objectives by sheer force of inertia. The thought was that if you had enough men who were willing and able to push through with their attack, they could simply overwhelm the enemy with their bodies. The belief in this method also believed that the increase in firepower that was happening at, the, at this point in history did not necessarily change the basic equation. It may change some of the details, but not the basics of having men charge at the enemy. On the other side, you had people who would fall into the firepower school of thought. They basically believed that the opposite of what I just explained was true. They believed that the increase in firepower from innovations like the machine guns, rapid firing, artillery, and other things made the more traditional theories of military science completely out of date. 
They believe that instead, men should be pushed forward in smaller, more dispersed groups to reduce the effectiveness of firepower. And they also put increased emphasis on junior officer autonomy and small unit tactics, which would be supported by all of the firepower available. These would be the two schools of thought that would drive discussions before the war. And you will note that they both dealt mostly with how to launch attacks, because everybody thought attacking would be required. During the Franco-Prussian War, both armies were still using the same sort of mass tactics that they had been using for generations. However, the Prussians also had more firepower, due to a combination of their infantry rifles and artillery pieces, both of which were generally superior to the French versions. Now, that's a very simplistic uh, explanation for why the French lost the Franco-Prussian War. There's a lot more there, uh, so maybe do some research on your own about that. After the defeat at the hands of the Prussians, the French would spend the next 40 years planning, training, and preparing for just one thing, a war with Germany. After the embarrassment which was the Franco-Prussian War, there was a period where all French military theory was based around the defensive. However, this did not last very long. There is at times the assumption that the French during this period were chasing the Germans, trying to imitate their plans and tactics, but this is not completely accurate. They spent a lot of time learning about the Germans and what they planned to do, and obviously this information would help them in the event of war. However, they did not believe that the Germans were necessarily superior in their theories and plans, and should be imitated, even after their good showing in 1870. Until around 1911, there was an emphasis on something called the defensive-offensive pattern. At its most basic level, this meant that the French, with their smaller population size and possibly slower mobilization schedules, would be forced on the defensive early in a war. However, as soon as the German advance had spent its strength, then the powerful counterattacks would begin. They never wavered from their idea that while firepower, especially as it increased, would cause casualties, decisive results would still come down to infantry assaults. It would be these infantry assaults that would drive back the Germans back into Germany, hopefully, and win the war. I find this defensive-offensive approach interesting because it's almost exactly what happened in 1914. Sure, the French first, first attack would fail, but then they would be forced back on the defensive until the German attacks were spent, at which point they would then attack uh, over the course of the next several years. An interesting counterfactual would revolve around what happens if the French did not launch any attacks at the beginning of the war, but instead stood on the defensive, avoiding all of the casualties, which numbered in the hundreds of thousands, that they suffered during their attacks. Central to the evolution of military thought during this period was the role and effects of the growing firepower available to the armies. The proponents of mass pulled heavily from historical tradition for their beliefs. However, over the last few decades of the 19th century, even they were forced to take a good hard look at some of the advances in technology. At the beginning of this time period, the volume of fire that could be generated was dictated by infantry with rifles, but even those were getting better, with more distant engagement ranges and much more accuracy. Because of this and other advances, the French actually began a slow and steady movement away from strictly massed infantry attacks, and instead began to focus on ways of mitigating the advantage that an enemy would gain due to its firepower. This meant an increased emphasis on cover, concealment, night attacks, dispersion, all ways of reducing the impact of firepower on attacking formations. I think that this is an interesting development because this represents a curve away from where the French were in 1870, and then also a different spot than where they would be in 1914, for reasons we will discuss here in a bit. I have not yet mentioned artillery, something that has played a central role in our podcast since the very first episode, because the French really did not discuss it that much either, at least in their infantry regulations. There were very few references to artillery in the French infantry regulations of 1900, preventing a standardization of how the infantry and artillery should work together on the battlefield. This would all begin to change in 1897, with the introduction of the famous French 75mm artillery gun. Part of the reason that this caused a change in the French regulations was that before the 75 which was introduced, the artillery was, for lack of a better term, rubbish. Since the French had been using the old-style cannon without a recoil mechanism, which had to be re-aimed after every shot, it greatly reduced the amount of effective fire that could be laid on a given target. Many theorists at this point considered a battery of machine guns to not just be better than a battery of artillery, but better by a factor of around 9 to 1, which is a lot. 
This prevented the artillery from being a truly useful tool on the battlefield, but this would change completely with the 75. Over the course of the 10 years before the war, the French would become extremely confident in their 75s. They believed that its ability to rapidly lay shells on a given target, through the utilization of its recoil mechanism and breech loading, would allow it to rule the battlefield. And in fact, this would cause the French to greatly overestimate the power of this gun, which would be pretty much the only one that they would have in 1914, and this would cause some issues in 1914. Before we get into specifics, let's talk just a bit about what the French thought the next war in Europe would be like. Obviously, these assumptions would drive many of their decisions that were made before the war. The French firmly believed, and they were joined by other countries in this belief, that the next European conflict would be short, and would probably be decided by the first few battles. This drove them away from a purely defensive strategy, a movement that would gain its greatest momentum right before the war started. Part of this calculation was from the belief that not attacking would make the country look weak, which is as good of a non-specific reason to attack as there could be, but there was also more concrete concerns. One of these was rooted in the classic maneuver warfare set of problems. It would be very bad if a French army who was on the defensive got outflanked, and there was a concern that if the French generals were too timid and defensive-minded, then they would be outmaneuvered, outflanked, and surrounded by the more energetic and aggressive Germans. There was also the issue of concentration. Defenders, by necessity, had to defend their entire front, at least early in the war before the area of enemy concentration was known. However, the attacker could concentrate his army at will, meaning that they would always have local superiority. There was no way to prevent this from happening, but since the French would be mobilizing less men than the Germans, it was a concern that if they stood on the defensive, then they would simply be overwhelmed at specific points by a few concentrated German attacks, and they would not be able to respond in time. The final factor was one of railway tables. Due to the complexity of mobilizing the ever-growing European armies, the railway timetables continued to get more and more complex. This meant that if an army wanted to be as efficient as possible when getting men to the border, they needed a very rigid plan to do so, and these could be planned literally years in advance. This made it almost impossible to improvise a large-scale attack. The Germans would use this excuse when they wanted to invade Belgium in 1914. This is what the plan said, this is what this is the trains they had, and this is where those trains were planned to go. To try and change it at the last minute would be a nightmare. Similar issues were at play for the French army. It would be a challenge to quickly move a large number of troops from one area to another to meet an energetic attack. When you combined all of these issues and beliefs into one, you could only arrive at one answer. All of that pre-planning and mobilization time should be spent preparing a launch to launch a massive French attack. That way, even if the Germans attacked somewhere else, they would be trading one area for another. Before discussing the doctrine of 1914, let's look at a previous revision of French regulations. For the purpose of this discussion, we will be looking at the French 1895 regulations, which is a good snapshot of what the French regulations looked like in the time before artillery and the offensive à la trace, which became to take over French policy before the war. This version of the regulations called for a four-phase attack. The first phase was the approach, which was really just getting in contact with the enemy and moving to a position where the French unit would want to attack from. During this time, the commanders would keep the men in tight formations, which were better for organizing and moving them on the march. They would use these same formations and groups when moving towards the enemy, but they would try to use some cover. However, the goal was to move fast, so that was always the first priority. The second phase was the deployment. During this phase, the commanders would get their troops ready to attack. They were not supposed to do this until their men could return fire against the defender, a distance that lengthened in the late 19th century, basically every time a new rifle was introduced. A critical piece of these regulations was that it did not dictate which type of deployment the officers of the attack should use, and how they should proceed with the attack. There was instead an emphasis on making sure that the terrain was used as much as possible to gain an advantage, and that tactics should be dictated by the enemy positions and dispositions. The third phase was then the skirmishing and closing with the enemy. The general recommendation was the infantry should deploy into a firing line at about 600 meters, then move forward in bounds while returning fire at the enemy until they were within 200 meters. 
Again, this was up for change by the officers on the scene, depending on the specifics of the situation. The final phase was the assault. Here, the commanders were told that they should not assault the entire enemy line at once, but instead should seek out weak points in the line where they should move their reserves to and launch attacks there. They should launch their attacks with the goal of capturing critical objectives, while also maintaining fire superiority, which should allow their troops to move around the battlefield easily. In these regulations, there were some pretty large omissions, specifically the lack of discussion about artillery and machine guns. In 1895, these were infantry regulations that were based on the premise that they would be fighting pretty much infantry-only battles. These were reasonable regulations, other than the omissions, of course, and it is interesting to see pieces discussed like the autonomy of officers at the front to guide their own attacks against a given set of objectives, and the critical role that fire and movement played in the attack. These would be concepts that would be washed away on the battlefields of 1914, and would not really return for the French and British until 1917. As we move into the changes in French doctrine in 1913, it's important to introduce a few thought leaders who would influence policy. Foss, Joffre, and de Castelnau, and Louis Grandmaison were all influential in rewriting the French regulations of 1913, and they would use it as an opportunity to, perform, to promote their all-offense, all-the-time theory of how to wage war. These were also the leaders of the army in 1914, it, with Grand Mason being the only one I think we haven't discussed in much detail, and he would be Joffre's chief of operations when the war began. While these regulations were adopted by the army, and they sought to indoctrinate all of the officers, it was not universally seen as the correct move. Many generals were hesitant or mistakenly misinterpreted the regulations as written, which would cause problems. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean Spiced Tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. The regulations of 1913 and 1914 committed the French army to attack à la trace, or attack to excess. However, there were some prerequisites that were thought necessary before the attack should be launched. First was that the commanders should attempt to maneuver to the flanks and to use cover to mask these movements. A frontal assault should be avoided, but critically, if that was all, all that was available, then it should not prevent the attack from being launched. Second, a skirmish line should be sent out first, which would advance in bounds to pin down the enemy. Then fire superiority should be gained to cut off the enemy from reinforcements. This fire would come in the form of infantry rifles, machine guns, and of course, the 75. Finally, the infantry, having been imbued with the belief that their bravery and sacrifice would guarantee success, would be told to press forward at all costs at a density of about one man per meter of attack. The hope was that this density would give the power that was needed. 
Behind this front line, which was actually two ranks of men, there would be another line. These men would be used to fill gaps in the front line and then launch their own attacks against a hopefully confused enemy after the front lines hit them. While all this would be happening, the artillery would be firing in close support of the infantry, using direct fire, with the goal of disrupting the enemy line of resistance and making it as unpleasant as possible for them to continue to fire on the attackers. The theory was that the pre-attack artillery fire would not need to take very long, maybe a quarter of an hour, and then the artillery would continue firing as long as it was possible while avoiding the infantry. Once the attack was in full force, the men were told to press forward, not to worry about the flanks or unit cohesion, but instead to push for deep objectives as hard and as fast as they could. The French also pushed decision-making authority down to the junior officers, who would be leading small units at the front, and this empowered them to keep attacking, to maintain the impetus of the attack. The crazy thing about these regulations, as written, was that they were decent if the assumptions under which they were built on were true. If the artillery was sufficient to disrupt the enemy, if the enemy was not strongly fortified, if the infantry moved forward in a reasonably dispersed manner with multiple lines to keep the attack going. And critically, if they were able to punch through the first set of enemy defenses and keep going independently. If all of these ifs happened, then the attack would look a lot like the German attacks later in the war. Unfortunately, these ifs would not end up happening in 1914. In these theories, there were some good bits, but there was a difference between having them on paper and putting them into practice. To explain why this was so difficult, we have to take a step back and look at the French army in 1914. The French army was made up of two-year conscripts. This was a system that was put in place by the 1905 military service law, and while there was some discussion of expanding it to a three-year enlistment, it was not done. Because of the short time that the conscripts were in the army, the men that were in a normal active duty French unit were often made up of more than 50% first-year Chinese. For example, in an infantry company that would have 225 enlisted men and just 7 career officers, this meant that 120 of those men might be in their first year, and even the officers would have widely varying levels of experience and knowledge. The final part to consider is that very few of these men had any level of any real battlefield experience. This made it difficult or impossible to pull off the complicated skirmishing, reinforcing, and attacking maneuvers that were required for the French tactics to succeed. Even in peacetime maneuvers, when theoretically the army had the best chance of performing well, men and officers for most units were found to be severely lacking and unable to consistently perform the concepts set forward in the regulations. This would be noted in the five years before the war, with even the last set of fall exercises in 1913 showing the same failures that had been happening for years. The inability to use the doctrine that was set forth caused many problems in 1914. Many French officers, due to a lack of training and knowledge, took the easy pieces of what they were told, attack, attack at all costs, attack, and eventually you will win, and discarded the more difficult pieces like maneuvering, covering, flanking, achieving fire superiority. It is very possible that this reduction in tactics down to their most basic level was just as responsible for the French failures of 1914 as the actual doctrine was. Then there was a tendency of officers, when in a stressful situation, to pull more power and knowledge towards them instead of out and empowered to their subordinates. When push came to shove, officers wanted men closer, under more control, not spread out and on their own. This was true at all levels of command, although it manifested differently at each level. I, don't want to make it, I do want to make it clear that I do not actually blame the frontline officers and men completely for reducing the tactics in this way. Since it was done at a mass level in almost all units, it can only point to mistakes made by those higher up in the chain of command, both in instruction and training. But of course, the regulations were not blameless for the failures. There were contradicting facets of the doctrine set forth to the army. It both tried to acknowledge the critical role of firepower on the battlefield with the skirmish lines and attempts to achieve fire superiority, while also making it clear that the shock value of the infantry assault would still win the day. This just made it worse for the officers trying to interpret it. Before we move on, I want to touch briefly on the bayonet. The bayonet is a weapon that is associated with the First World War in a very negative way, with the mental images of men going over the top with bayonets on their rifles to die to machine gun fire seeming to take up a lot of public mind space. 
The question, of course, becomes, was it a viable weapon during the First World War? And if not, why were so many countries still using it? Well, the first reason was that it was still believed that the bayonet attack, executed by men brave enough to carry it through, was still a viable method of attack. Now, I have often criticized, and many historians do this as well, the European countries on this very podcast for not paying attention to the Russo-Japanese War and not learning anything from that conflict, but in this case, they actually did pay attention. During that war, there were several very successful bayonet charges, and this seemed to prove that the bayonet was still a viable answer for the infantry, who were encountering ever-increasing amounts of firepower. There was also a second, more psychological advantage to having the infantry equipped with a bayonet. When a soldier has a bayonet mounted to a bolt-action rifle, it's often in his best interest to charge forward to use it instead of trying to use his rifle. The hope among commanders was that this would propel the infantry through the deadly fire zone of the enemy, whereas items like rifles, grenades, and machine guns would make them want to stop and take cover. Now, this is a good way to go. Often, an infantryman who is frightened or scared will stop in this zone of fire, which is simultaneously the most dangerous place for him to be, but also the one place he doesn't want to be moving around a lot in. This psychological benefit is the main reason that the bayonet would survive so long on the modern battlefield, far past the point where it was truly a useful weapon. It should be noted that this was used among all armies during the war, and even if it's not the most effective weapon system, it would still hearten the soldiers who had them and put fear into the enemies. There was always a lot of fear of being killed by a bayonet, uh, just as much as almost any other method of being killed during the First World War. We now, finally, arrive at 1914 and the start of the war. Joffre had put in place his plan, Plan 17, with which he would hurl the French armies against the Germans to the south of the Argonne Forest on the border shared between France and Germany. We all, of course, know that the Germans were going through Belgium. There's a lot of discussion that could be had about the mistakes made by Joffre in launching these attacks, but we're going to table that discussion for now and take our discussion several steps further down the ladder to the officers at the front. Here, the officers were found to be greatly lacking. Officers from generals to company and battalion commanders simply ignored many of the pre-war regulations. Their army was full of men, all with extremely high morale, which would not be a problem for the French for several years. However, since they ignored many of the regulations, they quickly began to have problems. One bit that they ignored the most was the need of getting fire superiority before launching an attack. Through a proper coordination of artillery and infantry, which was required by this point to make that happen. This allowed the Germans to fire down upon the attacking waves of infantry without even really needing to keep their heads down, which made all of their fire accurate and very deadly. Preventing these problems probably would not have made the attack successful, but it probably would have saved a lot of French lives, and in those early weeks, the French casualties were staggering, causing Joffre to begin making changes in mid-August to try and begin to stop the bleeding. These changes ran into three problems that were a direct result of pre-war choices made by the French. As the classic saying goes, the French went to war in 1914 with the army it had, not the army that it wished it had, even if in this case that still would have not been the one that it needed. First, in 1913, the regulations had relaxed the requirements to establish fire superiority when attacking. This was a huge problem in 1914, and it had been removed before the war out of the belief that it would slow the attack too much. This relaxing of regulations then had to be reversed once the war started, but then it was difficult to get all the army on the same page. The second problem was the 75, which while fantastic for open battles, was found to be severely lacking on the fortified battlefields of 1914, let alone what would come later. The final problem was the lack of artillery shells, which was a problem for all of the armies of 1914. These problems would be solved over time, however, what was not solved was a wrong turn that the French took early in the war. Before the war, they had tried to give a good amount of initiative and autonomy to their officers at the front. They wanted them to aggressively pursue offensive opportunities, not to sit at the front and wait to be told what to do. But this policy was about to change. The officers behind the front believed that the problem was in the execution of the attacks that they had ordered, not their tactics that were wrong. So they began increasing the amount of dictation and exact planning that was done for the attacks, 
This would just increase as the number of officers trained before the war began to dwindle as so many were killed. The second line in reserve officers had much less experience, and it was longer since they had active training, and this resulted in the concentration of power because upper level officers didn't trust the officers below them. Just like had been done at the front in the early attacks, only this was brought up the chain of command and institutionalized in the French army. Soon, entire offensives were planned around precise objectives and timetables, with one failure along the line creating a cascading effect along the front. Other armies would find this method of planning to eventually be a mistake, but it would come far too late for the French. Throughout the course of 1915, the French army and Joffre would try and figure out a way to solve all of these problems, and to try and fix them at the front. Joffre's preferred method would land on a methodical battle, which would have both deep and strategic objectives, but attempted to achieve them through a lengthy series of attack, not one big attack. This concept would be implemented through a series of changes throughout the year, and this process would begin on January 2nd, with a memo that was sent out to all commanders. Within this memo, Joffre encouraged his generals to meticulously plan their battles, and to attack on a wide front. Now, we know that this was the wrong path of innovation to go down, but over the next three years, the French would try time and again to execute this style of attack, slow, methodical, on a wide front. What they would find is that there was just no way to keep an attack going, no matter how much they scaled up the number of men used, or the amount of artillery they had, they just ran into the same problems. The Germans could simply reinforce their defenses before the French could continue attacking. Now, we know that this would be the outcome. However, in 1915, the French saw it differently. At Artois and Champagne throughout the year, they saw that sometimes, if they used enough artillery, they could make a little progress. But if they used more artillery, they could make more progress. With these bits of data, the way forward seemed obvious. Just keep scaling up the artillery, and the gains would follow. Unfortunately, this was not correct. French offensive doctrine, other than scaling up, did not see any large changes until Neville took command in late 1916. Neville had a new plan, sort of. His changes revolved around the idea of forgetting about deep objectives, and instead just planning for a series of methodically planned attacks with nearby objectives in mind, then launching these attacks again and again and again in rapid succession. Eventually, these constant attacks would get through the enemy defenses and into the open, and then things would change. This had been worked on by Neville at Verdun, where he had launched similar attacks on a much smaller scale. He believed that the theory was sound and could be scaled up as much as required. However, there was one big, glaring, insurmountable problem. The entire concept, which Neville called a rupture battle, relied on the French being able to reorganize and launch another attack before the Germans could respond. This had been possible at Verdun, where by the time Neville was attacking the Germans, they were already pulling their resources out for other parts of the front. However, when the Germans actually cared, which they would on the Chem de Dom, it would be a different story. It did not help that the Germans had switched up to a different defensive style. With Elastic Defense now the name of the game, many of the changes and adaptations that Neville had made from the previous style of attacks were pointless, since the Germans had altered their style of defense. Now we will discuss the changes that they made next episode, but in summary, they made it much more difficult to succeed by using smaller attacks with shallow objectives, since the entire defensive scheme was designed to absorb smaller losses of territory and then counterattack to drive the enemy back. Unfortunately, Neville would move forward with his attack and almost break the French army in the process. After those attacks, the French would finally shift from the strategic offensive, which they had been on since the start of the war, to the strategic defensive. Patan implemented an elastic defense in depth and suspended further large attacks as he tried to nurse the army back to health. The French would experiment with concepts like assault troops, which were all the rage in 1918, but it would not be something that they would implement on a large scale. Essentially, the French were about fought out by 1918, and they were now moving into a support role as the British and Americans took over the main role of attacking on the Western Front. This change was necessitated by the fact that the French army strength at the front had fallen from 2.2 million to 1.6 million men in 1918. So instead of launching more operations, the French took it upon themselves to equip the American forces now arriving in large numbers, and this occupied a good portion of French equipment output for the year. To summarize, the French had come into the war with an idea of how to fight it, 
and they had been somewhat correct in these ideas. There was an emphasis on small unit autonomy and the movement of control as far down the chain as possible. And then this would be coupled with the goal of achieving fire superiority to create an environment where an attack could be successful. However, the difficulties of training units to execute such attacks would make them change it up and bring control higher and remove autonomy from units at the front in favor of meticulously planned assaults. This would make them less flexible, even as the armies around them in 1917 and 1918 were becoming more flexible. Next episode, we will jump into the army of the French nemesis, the Germans, to see how they adapted to the changing nature of battles on the Western Front during the war.